Today's episode is sponsored by Honey, the easy way to save when shopping on your iPhone or computer. How do you feel about online shopping? Do you do it often? And how many times do you scour the internet looking for a promo code that works when it's time to check out? Well, thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is the free shopping tool that finds promo codes and applies the best one it finds to your cart. Imagine you're shopping on one of your favorite sites. When you check out, the Honey button appears, and all you have to do is click Apply Coupons and wait a few seconds as Honey searches for coupons it can find for that site. If Honey finds a working coupon, you'll watch the prices drop. And Honey doesn't just work on desktop, it works on your iPhone too. Just activate it on Safari, on your phone, and save on the go. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting the show. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash podcast. That's joinhoney.com slash podcast. Coming up. She said her inability to say no to her then husband, the JSO detective William Bear, drew her into this tragedy. And she claimed Bear threatened to keep her quiet. For Vault Studios, I'm Reed Redmond. And I'm Will Johnson. You're listening to The Daily Crime. In Jacksonville, Florida, the final chapter of a 1999 murder case is the ex-wife of a convicted killer is sentenced for her role in the killing. My family definitely has peace. Um, I don't think closure ever applies to any of this um, because you can't ever get your loved one back, but um, definitely feel like justice being served is definitely a confirmation that one should always hold out hope. And in central Ohio, investigators have arrested a man they say was running a catalytic converter theft ring. They orchestrated an enterprise of around six people. We know it's more. We're working on additional indictments. It was a night like any other. You ate some dinner with the family, chatted for a bit about school and work. Everything seemed normal. Then suddenly, you were gone. But they didn't need to worry. You just snuck off for a second to play Best Fiends. Best Fiends is the mobile puzzle adventure game you want to play for hours on end, even when you only have a few moments to spare. From the vibrant artwork and adventure pack storyline to the cute collectible characters and supercharged power-ups, Best Fiends is designed to be the most obsession-worthy game ever. There are literally thousands of levels, plus tons of in-game events added every month for even more ways to win. And the best part is... You can play anytime, anywhere. No Wi-Fi, no problem. Of course, people may start to wonder about your mysterious disappearances until they see how much fun you're having. Download your new favorite getaway, Best Fiends, for free today on the App Store or Google Play. You'll even get $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Will, last week, a woman named Melissa Jo Schaefer was sentenced for her role in a 1999 murder Let's go back to, to 1999. What happened? It was May 17th of 1999. Saad Kawaf, a convenience store owner, said goodbye to his wife before walking out the door of his house to head to work. Police say two suspects were waiting outside and attacked Kawaf in his driveway. Here's reporting on the case from our partner station, WTLV First Coast News in Jacksonville. In May of 1999, convenience store owner Saad Kawaf was attacked by a man in his driveway in the Deerwood neighborhood. His wife, also grabbed by a female attacker, dragged back into the house and duct taped to a chair. Saad Kawaf's wife later told officers she heard a scream, and when she opened the door, she saw her husband being dragged into their garage while being beaten and stabbed. Saad Kawaf died from his injuries. His wife recovered from the attack. And at the time, the only information police had was that the suspects were a white male and a white female. The case then would go unsolved for decades, but investigators were eventually able to use genetic genealogy to track down two suspects in the case. First, tell us about the DNA evidence that they were able to use. From police reports, we understand that during the course of her struggle with the female attacker, Mrs. Kowalf bit the attacker, a fact that 20 years later would provide the key to identifying the attackers. She actually got a piece of the female attacker's DNA. The state attorney's office says blood and nail clippings from the scene that were run through genetic genealogy databases led current cold case detectives to William Bear and his then-wife, 
now ex-wife, Melissa Jo Schaefer. In 2003, two DNA profiles were developed, and then all the way in May of 2020, uh, through uh, some, some submissions to the FDA lead laboratory for genetic genealogy testing, we developed two profiles that actually gave us indications of who our suspects were. Then approximately two weeks ago, in June of this year, the FDA, FDA lead laboratory provided detectives with potential suspect names, where this is where it takes a turn, which we are uh, a little saddened by. It turns, that turns out that your suspect was indeed William Robert Bear Jr., white male, 64 years of age, who was a retired Jacksonville Sheriff's Office police officer, and his then wife, Melissa Jo Schaefer, white female, 50 years of age. So it's 20 years later than in July of 2020 that this retired Jacksonville Sheriff's Office detective, William Bear, and his ex-wife, Melissa Jo Schaefer, were arrested and, and brought in for questioning. What happens from there? Bear was apparently defiant and said he had nothing to do with it, but Melissa Jo Schaefer, his wife and now ex-wife, eventually confessed to her role in the crime and agreed to testify against her ex-husband, her husband at the time. In her interview with police, she told them, I'm just glad it's over. And then just last year, William Bear pleaded guilty for his role in the murder, including first-degree murder and kidnapping. In an orange jumpsuit, William Bear entered the courtroom and pleaded guilty, sentenced to three concurrent life sentences. The state attorney's office had said they were looking at going for the death penalty in this case if it went to trial, because when all the pieces came together, it was a pretty ironclad case. Today in court, he was mostly quiet, not speaking on his own behalf or addressing the Kwa family. Chief Assistant State Attorney L.E. Hutton calling the former detective a disgrace. He committed the ultimate betrayal. He used law enforcement information in order to commit a crime that cost the life of an individual and forever changed the lives of everyone else. He is what he is, which is a murderer, and that's the way he should re be remembered for the rest of his life. Melissa Jo Schaefer eventually pleaded guilty to five counts of murder and aggravated battery in 2020 in relation to the 1999 murder. And that brings us to what happened just last week. Melissa Jo Schaefer was sentenced in a Florida courtroom. What sentence did she receive? Melissa Jo Schaefer was sentenced to 30 years in a Florida state prison. During the sentencing hearing, she tried to explain her role in the attack before apologizing to the family members of the victim. She said her inability to say no to her then-husband, the JSO detective William Bear, drew her into this tragedy, and she claimed Bear threatened to keep her quiet. I cannot forgive myself for what I did, and I cannot expect you to forgive me. But I do hope that you will be able to, for to find forgiveness in your hearts. Not for my benefit, but the, for the peace that it may give you. Now, after Schaefer read her apology, I saw her turn around and mouth the words, I'm sorry to people who knew her, I'm assuming her loved ones. Schaefer, who's 52, will be in prison till she's 77. Something I'm still wondering, were police ever able to identify a motive in this case? Reed, as we've mentioned, William Bear was a Jacksonville Sheriff's Office detective back in 1999. And over the course of the investigation, detectives determined that Bear had been watching Kowaf's house as part of an intelligence unit because there was suspicion that San Kowaf was illegally selling pseudoephedrine at his store and that there was a large amount of money inside the home. So robbery may have been the primary motive for the crime. And in fact, $30,000 was stolen from the home. He was an active police officer with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office at the time of the murder. And uh, all the information that we have thus far points to his initial contact and acquaintanceship uh, with the victim stemmed directly from his assignment here at the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. There is, uh, of course, a lot more to this case. Will, you covered this on our weekly podcast, True Crime Chronicles, back in 2020, right? That's right. We spoke with First Coast News reporter Katie Jeffries about this case. She had covered this one for her Unsolved series on First Coast News. And if you want to go back and listen to our podcast episode, it's our True Crime Chronicles episode from July 27th, 2020, episode number 59, Murder in the Driveway.
This week, police in Ohio arrested a man they say was behind a massive catalytic converter theft ring. Reed, tell us about the case. Yeah, so to just kind of start with some of the basic details, our partner station, 10TV in Columbus, Ohio, reported that this man stands accused in more than 1,100 catalytic converter thefts. His name is Tommy Cox. He's from South Columbus, and he's facing 37 felony counts, including charges of theft, receiving stolen property, money laundering, and engaging in a pattern of corrupt activity. So over 1,000 thefts. Clearly, this wasn't just one or two thieves running around with a a saw cutting out catalytic converters. What exactly do investigators say this operation looked like? 10TV spoke to Groveport Police Detective Josh Gilbert, who said that the enterprise involved at least six people, potentially more than that, and that they have made other arrests of some of the alleged accomplices. But according to Gilbert, it was Cox who was at the head of the operation. Basically, Mr. Cox was paying individuals to go cut catalytic converters as well as cutting them himself, paying them a very low rate of $50 to $100 per converter, then turned around, formed an LLC as a business, and he was scrapping. Uh, we have him confirmed to scrap 1,172 converters. Reed, it feels like every other day there's a story in the news about catalytic converter thefts. What exactly is going on here? Why do thieves seem to be targeting these devices more and more often? Well, reporting here from 10TV and the Associated Press points out that a lot of these devices, exhaust emission control devices, contain precious metals, particularly platinum, palladium, and rhodium. And in recent years, I guess the prices of those metals have skyrocketed, and that makes anything containing these metals a lot more of a lucrative target for thieves. So as a result, thefts of catalytic converters have jumped in the last couple of years. The thieves cut out the devices from underneath parked vehicles, then they take them to scrapyards, get cash for them, and then the scrapyards turn around and sell them to recycling facilities. And there is apparently a lot of money in it. In this case, Groveport Police Detective Josh Gilbert said that they did a nine-month investigation and found that Tommy Cox received around half a million dollars in cash. So if investigators were looking into this for nine months, if they knew these thefts were going on, why didn't they step in sooner? That's a great question. The way this detective explained it is that they didn't want to just get the guys out doing the thefts. They wanted to arrest the bigger fish, who in this case they're saying is Tommy Cox. Here's how Gilbert explained it. Well, we knew if we just, the, the, the individuals that we were catching that were out here cutting them, we knew that if we stopped there, that the main supplier would just get another person to come cut it. He was actually assigning individuals to certain jurisdictions so that they weren't crossing each other's paths. So we had two individuals that were actually assigned to the city of Groveport to come cut converters in the city of Groveport. If we would have just thrown them into jail on a simple F5 property crime, they would have bonded out probably continued doing it due to drug habits and or just got somebody else. So we knew we had to kind of take it off at the source. And Reed, what about the impact on the victims of these thefts? What's it costing them? So it's a pretty expensive car part to replace. It can cost over $1,000 on top of just making the car unusable while it's being worked on, which of course leads to other costs for people who rely on those vehicles to get to work or take their kids to school. And as I mentioned, this is becoming more and more common. According to the National Insurance Crime Bureau, the number of catalytic converter thefts reported in claims to insurance companies jumped from around 3,300 in 2019 to over 14,000 in the year 2020. And different types of vehicles apparently have different materials in their catalytic converters. So what Detective Gilbert says is this ring targeted kind of your your regular everyday cars and, and commuter vehicles but they also targeted bigger box trucks and things like that that apparently have more of these precious metals in their catalytic converters. They would do both. They, they kind of started out with individual cars. They quickly learned about the three precious metals inside of them that were a lot more valuable. Whenever you're talking about uh, commercial motor vehicles, you got a lot more of the three precious metals in there. So they quickly switched over to majority of commercial box trucks. Now, a lot of times you have more than one converter under there. So... Um, it's very quick two cuts per converter and they're out, you know, commercial are going to get anywhere from six to $1,500 at a scrap yard per converter. Uh, whereas your average car, you're going to get three to 600. And what's being done to try to solve this problem in Ohio and also around the country? Well, some states, according to this story, have tried to toughen penalties for would-be thieves. They've also tried to put in place some stricter requirements on scrap metal dealers with the thought being that You know, these catalytic converters only have value to thieves if the thieves are able to turn around and sell them. Uh, Looking at Ohio specifically, police say they think that this arrest, because of the scope of the theft ring that Tommy Cox is accused of running, 
it might lead to a significant reduction in catalytic converter thefts in central Ohio. But they also say that as long as the law stays where it's at, thieves will continue to steal catalytic converters. Well, I guess the thing that we want to say is we have other groups out there hitting us now, and we're aware of them. We're working it in the same manner. There's so much technology that goes into solving one of these. It's not an overnight case. Um, for GPS tracking devices, things that we can do now. You know, we executed nearly 20 search warrants in this case, and those are not all residents. You know, those are phones, those are social media platforms, putting people on the scene with their GPS data. So there's probably people out there right now stealing them, even in the city of Groveport and around, that think they've gotten away with it. All right, Reed, thanks for bringing us that story, and thanks for listening to The Daily Crime. We are here five days a week, Monday through Friday, with new episodes. If you haven't already, check out our weekly show, True Crime Chronicles. For The Daily Crime, I'm Will Johnson, along with Reed Redmond.